going to make the three-time USDGC champion wait any longer. We're going to get in, get him in here. It's been a hot minute, but we have your three-time USDGC champion, Will Shoestrick. How's it going, brother? What's up, guys? How's it going? Oh, it's going. Uh, this is someone, Welcome, buddy. Uh, yeah, Hello, I'm, I'm excited to have this interview. I kind of bumped into you every one, a little bit this past week, but you know, I think we were kind of all doing stuff. So I didn't really want to bother you at all. And I kind of had in my back of my head, like maybe I can ask him if he comes, comes on the podcast and we can actually have like a decent long conversation. So I'm, I'm very excited to uh, get the opportunity of talking with you. I've got a lot to ask, so I'm just going to jump in right away. How was this past week for you? Uh, it was fun. You know, um, <clears throat> even though I don't like to say like I was out there to like have fun, like nobody, everybody's there to have fun, right? Like, you know, it's uh, showing up and seeing people I haven't seen for a long time. Like I used to travel with them in the car for years, you know, example being Paul, you know, I haven't seen him in six, eight months, something crazy like that because people go all over the world. So um, it's nice to see people and my friends I haven't seen for a long time, catch up for a little bit. Um, it's obviously really nice to play the course and uh, to be seen is always nice. Um, you know, I really do appreciate people that have won the tournament before, be able to come back and compete for however long they want to play. I think that's a pretty cool thing. So, um, yeah, it was just a good week. Like I didn't have any expectation going into it and, uh, just wanted to compete and that was it. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, you real quick, wait uh, before you go, Brody, since you've won yeah. it three times, do you think maybe you could give Brody and I the other two so that we could compete forever? Is I'll that, bring my rings next time. It works. Just hang out. <laughs> just sneak in. Be like, yeah, hey, I got a ring, Perfect. man. Let me in. Perfect. No, I was, I was going to say, if the PDJ is listening, maybe they can kind of take a book out of USCGC and uh, let past champions play at the World Championships. Um, yeah. For yeah, future I one. think that's just. A, I honestly think that's a growing pain. That's just got to happen. Like you know, there's a lot of things that's growing a lot with the sport. I think that's one of those things that's just got to be part of it. You know, like no matter what, if somebody wins a world championship and and you know, take Avery for an example, take anybody who's won a world title and they're 65 years old, if they can sign up, they just get exemption, rated 800. They play one tournament a year. It's pro world. You let them in, whatever. You know, they're gonna. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, especially if we get the if we can get to like cuts, and then it's like, okay, that person's yeah. only playing two rounds, and and then they're gone. And but I think seeing past champions out there, and, and I want to ask you now about the skins match. You know, playing with Ken, Barry, Nate, like having those past champions, having that history does a lot. And you know, coming from myself, who really wasn't paying attention to disc golf until twenty twenty hearing as much as I've heard from you, about you, about Ken, about Barry, and then seeing you guys play for the first time in person, it is, it is something special and that only builds. So, you know, let us know kind of how, how did this skins match first off? Like how did that come about? And then just kind of walk us through your experience doing that. Yeah. Jonathan pool, it was kind of his idea of, you know, wanting to put together something before the tournament was kind of the idea was actually the initial idea was, Hey, I'm going to try to put something before the tournament. People could come out and watch like they have done GK pro skins at all the pro tour events. And, uh, he's, he said he was going to try to get some of the past champions. Didn't really know who was going to be there in time to be able to do it. And then, um, it was funny that one of my friends texted me and said, Hey, you didn't tell me about this. I was like, oh, thanks for telling me about it. <laughs> so uh, I knew it was going to go. I thought it was going to go on before the tournament. But, you know, after the second rounds, it's all fine. I, I had said, you just you just tell me what's going on and I'll be there. I, I doesn't really matter to me, whether it's Monday, Sunday, Friday, after the last round, what you know, whatever it is. And so the, the initial posting was me, Kenny Barry, and it seemed a little light. Like there's a lot of previous champions that they could have chosen. I'm very thankful that they did ask me to be a part of it. Um, you know, there's Brinster, Feldberg, you know, they could have, I, I don't know if Nate would have ever made it to come play, but people would go out and, and kind of to your point, uh, there was really not a whole lot of footage like there is now back then mm -hmm. to watch Ken Climo and to watch Barry Schultz. And even me coming up and, and even winning USDGC in 2014, the footage wasn't anywhere near that it is now. Like it just is the next level. 
you know, there used to be Marty McGee with Fly, uh, I forgot his YouTube channel, Fly So High Productions, and he had the highest quality footage out there that you could watch. And now, you know, the footage isn't even comparable to, to that stuff that goes on. So I think it's a big step in just teaching the history of the sport at the same time. Like, you know, those people might have never seen Ken Climo play, and he's won however many 12 world championships, which is crazy, you know, and they're diehard disc golf fans and has never seen the, you know, one of, or the greatest of all time play disc golf. That's crazy to think about. Yeah. And I, I agree. I think having, having these events too, for people that are, you know, curious or whatnot, maybe they see you play in person or they see Ken play and they go and they try to find some old footage of them playing and, and dig a little bit more into the history of disc golf. Um, but I think having this, this is an event that I, we, we talked about a little bit before you got on here. This is an event that I think they have figured out. It works really well. The crowd was loving it. And it's something that you can cycle in like the Nate Sexton spot or whatever. You can cycle in some like guys that are kind of on the way out, but not necessarily still, you know, playing. You can cycle maybe some of those people in and still have some of these legends of disc golf playing. I think it's something very special. I, I watched all, um, I think we left after hole 17. Um, but I watched the first eight holes and I loved it. I loved every second. So I hope they continue to do it. Um, can you, for those that maybe not, not aren't as familiar with your career, can you kind of break down just like when, turning pro, if you want to start there, maybe go, but earlier kind of just like how your, how your career in disc golf has gone. That's all because of Paul. <laughs> But crazy story. I mean, this is, you know, this is one of those things like things happen for a reason. So like in 20, 2016, my dad and I flew out to the Memorial to play the Memorial and I played intermediate. I got fourth place. And after the round at Dukes, we went out, my dad and I were just playing disc golf and I ran in to somebody who I saw throw 500 feet for the first time ever. And he didn't even use an X step. And it was Paul and his dad and his buddy playing. And I'm like, Oh my God, this guy is amazing. This is incredible right now. And I met him at the first big tournament I ever went to. I still have a DX birdie in my garage signed by uh, like Feldberg Sprague, Climo Jenkins, all these players from the first term I ever went to, I remember. And there was Paul afterwards throwing these like massive Anheuser's with what was like a CFR Wraith at the time, I think is what it was probably like a $400 disc now for all I know. But that he was the first person I ever saw on a course throw over 500 feet. And what's crazy is later that year, I went to Am Worlds in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I played junior worlds. I met Chandler Fry. And we always joke because he stayed the same size and I've grown like a foot since 2016 <laughs> world. He's easily the biggest kid at AM Worlds. Um, but we played together in 2016. Gage McNutt won. I remember that clearly. And then I they had Disc Golf TV, for those that had no idea what that is. Shout out to uh, the Hanson Beg family for probably the first ever like highlight uh, website for yeah. Disc Golf. People don't even know what that is. Discgolftv.com. It. it was amazing. They have some of the best footage, and there's so much good archive footage. Like Disc Golf TV is an example. They had some of the best stuff. Timmy Gill and him were like doing some some cool things, and that would be amazing footage to to drum up. But uh, I remember going back, and it was weeks later. It took forever to edit footage and get it online. But I was like, oh, who won? And there's, there's Paul hitting a putt to win in a playoff to be AM world champion in 2016. And I'm like, Hey, that's the kid that we kid. I said kid, but that's the guy that we saw at the Memorial. No way. And he like hit this huge butt to win AM worlds. Like, that's amazing. What are the chances of that? We play with him at the Memorial and he wins AM worlds in 2016. Like that's, that's amazing. And, uh, just going on from there, like I would just play local leagues. Like at my biggest suggestion for players is what I did is play local leagues and find people that are just better than you, that are good examples on and off the course to get connected with and just play disc golf with them. Like watch what they're doing, learn what they're really good at, learn what they're bad at practice putting when you can 
and, you know, have a good attitude and just continue to compete on the course. And that's really what I did from 2016, 2017, and then 2018, I started playing a little bit bigger and trying to travel a little bit. Uh, sorry, 2008, 2008, I started traveling just a little bit more and, um, I was still in high school, but 2008 and 2009, I actually got approval from my high school to miss classes because I was a professional athlete. And so I would actually oh. get my absences excused kids that are in high school that are looking to play disc golf. You can use this and you're up your sleeve. Uh, I got it approved because I was a professional athlete. Like I could prove that I made money and prove that I was a sponsored player from Minova at the time and would go to tournaments. So I would miss Thursday, Friday, just about every week or every other week. And I would be the kid that came back on Monday and bought everybody a slice of pizza from the cafeteria. Cause I made money at the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's, That's so awesome. funny. Cause I remember, I remember Will and then this exact moment that he's talking about in 2016. 2000 or 2006 yeah yeah 2006 i remember just this little shrimper man and we were playing together and i remember watching him throw and being like what the heck he could throw it so straight and so good and he just kind of hopping around you know it reminded me a lot of uh um and will you can attest for this when Anthony Barella was coming up and he would yeah, follow us yeah. around and, and that was you back then. And, and, uh, yeah, years later, um, he brings up the story, but I remember will being insanely good, even at that age and me being like, I didn't know little kids were good. Like what the heck? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's so funny. I haven't thought of that moment in a long time. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. So what, what, where do you go from there? You're, uh, you know, I, I, I don't really know your history that well. So I'm, that's why I'm really curious. Are you talking with your parents about college? Are you saying, Hey, I think I can make a living doing this. Like what, what's, what are the decision making in, in high school for you now that you're actually going out and making money playing disc golf? Yeah. And I was making money and really kind of doing my thing from 2008, 2009. So like going into my final year of high school, graduated 2010, that was kind of like the path that I wanted to go in. Like I had a 98 Honda core that I would drive to and from tournaments. I specifically remember before USDGC, the head gasket blown out and going to buy like a 2004 Honda civic or something like that, whatever it is. And I just remember like, Hey, I'm just going to go play tournaments. And I was never home. And you guys know when you're on tour, you're, you, there's really no such thing as home. You know, maybe if you fly around nowadays and it's a little bit different, but back then you played 40 tournaments a year, 40, 45 mm -hmm. tournaments. Like it was a grind. Yeah. Like you're playing C tier, B tier, A tier national tours every eight weeks or something like that. Like they were massively spread out and you're just kind of waiting for that day to come around but you would really just find your way through the tour. You would pick a spot. You heard a B tier, you know, a little honey, honey hole would have a thousand dollars added, $2,000 added. Honey pot. It's like <laughs> the honey pot. Paul knows the honey pots. Like he would go to him in the middle of Utah and be like, what does Paul do in the middle of Utah? Oh, first place was $1,800. Okay. What the heck happened there? <laughs> But that, that was the days. I mean, that was really like you just knew of these like local TDs that could fundraise money and you would, they would know, you know, Hey, I really like Paul. Hey, Paul, I've got 5,000 added. If you want to come out here. Oh yeah, sure. And then you would show up and there'd be a huge payout like that. That's not really like that silent anymore. Like there's a lot of events that have just grown up. There's not many honey, honey pots out there. There, there might be, but it seems like back in the day, it was every single weekend you could go. Mm -hmm. C tier that randomly paid out over a thousand dollars or B tier stuff like that. Like A tiers were massive wins. And nowadays it's like what, you know, A tier is a, a good win, but it's not, it's not anything what it used to be. And so 2010 came around and really I graduated high school, got in my car, just started driving, going to tournaments. And, uh, I never applied to college, never, never applied to, to go anywhere. Didn't really have a intention, but not like a, like a desire, I guess, for college, because I, I has well, I was already had this path where I wanted to go and saw that I wanted, that I knew I could make money, not necessarily long-term. It was more of just young and dumb. I'm getting in my car and driving to go play disc golf. See you later type thing. So, you, so you, at this point in time, you're not thinking like, Hey, I think I can be like a world champion. I think I can win like majors and 
you're just like, Hey, I can just go around, play disc golf, make some cash and live the life. Like yeah, not necessarily. I didn't necessarily think I couldn't win, but I was just like, this is, this is what I'm going to do. You know, this is like, mm. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to play every day. I'm going to practice and I want to be the best, but I'm not thinking like, Hey, you know, like nobody's thinking long, you know, whether they think they are or not when you're 18, 19, you don't think long-term for <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, you might think you do, but yeah. you don't at the same time. Like you're doing what you want to do. You know, that's, that's kind of how it is. And so uh, very fortunately, 18 came around. And I remember playing an eight year in Atlanta, Georgia, that I lost to Barry Schultz. I think I got third. I think I lost to Avery and Barry. And I remember calling my best friend, Big Andy, and just saying like, hey, I really feel like I can compete with the guys. Like, I feel like I could win next weekend. And I remember telling him that on the phone, sitting in my car, thinking like, I really think I can win the uh, USDGC next weekend. And I went there and I practiced for seven days before the tournament. First time, or it wasn't the first time going there. That was uh, my third or fourth time because I played it when I was 15 in 2007. I got a state qualifier for those that didn't know. You used to get a one state, got a qualifying event, and one person from each state could go play. It could be anybody of any caliber, and they didn't have to give yeah, it away. State rep. State rep. The TD of the Do tournament. Do you have to like show that you're from that state, though, or could you like show up to like a dark horse state to try to win? Win. I think that you have to be from the state. Okay. You did. Yeah. Yeah. From what I remember, and the That's TD interesting. could have kept the TD could have kept the exemption. So it's like, hey, your event in Tennessee we're going to give away a USDGC spot. The TD could have kept it. And like, a lot of them did. yeah, a lot of them did. And just, <laughs> I just so happened to get the qualifier and I was 15 and I think I won the open event if I remember. And, and yeah, I got to play the USDGC at 15 and that doesn't happen anymore. Like it's only qualifier at pro tour events or worlds or something along those lines, but you don't get, the like there used to be over 300 players that played the USDGC and it's, it's yeah, just not like that anymore. Wow. Yeah. And, and that's, that's one of the biggest changes is like you would go there and players would be 900 rated playing the USDGC. I bet there's people that have never been over 950 that have played USDGC five times or more. Because that sounds, that's, like a, that's forever. sounds like a nightmare. It, it sounds was, like an absolute nightmare having those it, people on the course. <laughs> it was tough, man. You know, my first my first time going to the USCGC, I made the cut at 144th place. We had a cut, <laughs> and I was 144th place. I made the cut on the dot. And my final <laughs> round, I played with Carrie Burlogger, Des Redding, and Angela <laughs> Chick Fry, and they all whipped me. I'll never forget it. <laughs> Like I was yeah. playing with these world champions and I think the U S champion. And, uh, I remember going in, like, just being like, Oh, I'm going to crush everybody, you know? And they just killed me. They just threw their little 300 foot shots inbounds every, everywhere. I shot like a 79 or so, or 82. <laughs> and that course was wide open compared to what we play <laughs> yeah. now. That was a field. Like that was just like throw it wherever you want to go like no out of bounds scenarios, like no Mando mm -hmm. on five. There's no OB on hole six, you know, no Mando on seven, no OB on eight and a shorter basket position. I mean, you can go on and on and on. You every just chuck is, it wherever. Every hole is 50% easier. I would say, honestly, like you could just throw yeah. it, but, it, but at the time it was so hard. It was really like, wow, this is <laughs> yeah. like, above, like above and beyond what's going on. And so that's changed a lot. And I mean, honestly, going like story-wise, it was just like a blink. I was talking to somebody the other day. It's like a blink of an eye. Like I had, you know, you miss when you're on tour, you miss everything. So for eight to 10 years, I missed all birthdays, all family, anything, all graduations, anybody growing up, like, you know, you, you listen to any top athlete, like you just, you, that's second. It comes second. That's it. You know, you're there to play, compete and win. And when you're done competing, you're back training, getting ready to be the best again. And, uh, that's one of the things that kind of took me away from wanting to be on tour. I was just kind of over missing all that stuff, you know, like building any type of life or building a future like disc golf was my future, but it was kind of like winding down ton of players getting into the sport that were playing and competing and were great. And, uh, I was just kind of over missing 
being having a home base. Wait, hmm. wait, Will, you're you. So you you say to you say to Big Andy, let's go back a little bit. You say to Big Andy, I think I can win. What happens after that? I did win. That was the year I did win. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, and, and from there, I mean, from there, it just rocket shipped. You know, it just is. Yep. As soon as you win that, obviously, everybody's in your court of, yeah, this is obviously what you need to be doing. And so just get ready. I would drive every year from Tennessee to Phoenix. I would practice for the Memorial. It would almost be like a pit stop in Vegas, and then you would drive back and play Memorial again because it was two days after Vegas. And that was that was for almost 10 years straight, 8 to 10 years I would do that. And that yes. was just what you did. That's what everybody did. What was um, what was it like after you won, on the, like the outside the disc golf stuff? So like the contracts, um, social media was kind of picking up around that time. So like what what did that look like back then in disc golf? Of where, you know, I'm I'm assuming at that point no one really kind of, this was like you kind of putting your name on the map. So what did that kind of look like and kind of compare that to what it is now with, you know, like an Isaac Robinson, for example, yeah, yeah, who it's, had, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty funny, like almost, almost unbelievable to a point, you know, like you win and, and, uh, I don't think in 2010 was it, I don't think Instagram was around at all, but like, I, I want to say I started Gosh, I'm trying to think. Cause 2010 is right when I graduated. I think I think Instagram was around, but like very early. Yeah, like I Twitter. Remember, I think Twitter was like 2008 or something. Maybe yeah, something. I fact remember. There. I remember that year in 2011. Like I really learned about promotion and marketing. I remember maxing okay. out my friends on Facebook and being yes. like, "Dang, I'm cool." Like, what's up? <laughs> Five thousand. Yeah, you're. Five thousand. You're thin- you're sending like literally you can send like 500 invites or so at a time. And you're just like reminding people, Hey, like you need to like my page. You need yeah, to, you need exactly. to like my page. Yeah. So it was like making a Facebook page, starting to do more YouTube videos, starting to starting. I'm pretty sure I started an Instagram. Like, you know, I remember when I was the only disc golfer with 10,000 followers on Instagram. And now it's like, some people pick that up after, two weeks, you know, and they just, they the just, the K is big. The K yeah. was big though. I remember when I got the K like that, everyone remembers when you get from 9,000, nine, whatever. And then you, all of a sudden it's just one zero K you're like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to get the well, uh, confetti well, here. Maybe I'm going to do a little, a yeah. little, like uh, <laughs> a little background about Willie back in the day. So our first guy who ever started promoting anything was Avery Jenkins. He was like the godfather of, mm-hmm. of being very active on social media, building a brand for himself. But I specifically is this mostly remember Facebook too. Is this, is that really where it was? Everything Facebook. Everything was and Facebook? Then, you know, a, a lot of it was in person stuff. So doing clinics and growing mm. your brand that way, bringing merch that, that your company stamped with your stuff on there. So Avery was a original of that, but then will, when will started winning his tournaments, this guy was an absolute grinder. Like he would, they started YouTube. He had an actual cameraman with him. Um, most of the time filming all of his rounds, uh, Will took it to a whole nother level as far as that stuff goes that nobody else did. I think it was, you know, I don't, I don't know what year it was, but eventually it turned into him, Kayla Visca and Felberg all traveling in a baby RV and, and, and showing the world their week to week life and what that was, what that was like. And then they were doing clinics in every single spot. So like nowadays, we ask all our players to do social media and stuff. But back then everybody wanted you to do clinics because that was like, you get that face to face. And that was like our big selling point is to like, okay, yeah. Talk in front of a bunch of people, create your fans. Will was like a absolute grinder back in the day. He was the first person to do all of that stuff. So go ahead, go ahead, Will. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I remember, I mean, it was really, the very beginnings of disc golf hitting that like tech boom 
you know, like it got like technical. I remember UDISC and sending and sending people from UDISC, like Matt from UDISC and saying like, Hey, your app's really cool. I've, I've never seen an app like this. And, and I like posted online about it. And I remember him sending me a message and being like, Hey, you're really the first row that's ever even noticed our app online. Like it just keeps score. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's like a cool app. Like it's a cool name. And stuff. So we jokingly, every time I'll, I'll, I see Matt every now and then it's like, Hey, he's like, yeah, Will was the first one that posted about you disc like online. And now it's, now it's nice. like next level, you know, that's, that's their full-time job and they've got a massive staff now. So like, that's really like I say tech boom, but like disc golf kind of lags behind on a lot of things when it comes to like being cool and technical and that kind of, you know, cool looking branding instead of just like a basket and every logo, like cool branding, cool shirts, cool jerseys, like, you know, esports looks so cool and disc golf kind of lag behind a little bit when you have like you know, it, when you look at old disc golf companies, it's kind of like that's kind of stuck in the 90s for a lot, 80s, 90s for a long time. And so it took a long time to get caught up. But I do remember setting up clinics. Like I love setting up clinics. Like I love the, I love the uh, organization of setting things up, promoting it to get people to come out, like, you know, doing, doing little events and signings and videos. Like I just enjoy, have always enjoyed doing that kind of stuff. And what's funny is I was never like an outgoing kid ever in high school. Like I was super quiet, dirty, little shrimpy, like Paul was saying, braces, glasses, flat bill hat that looked like this. My mom buzzed my hair growing up. Like that was just who I was. Did you transition into that pretty, like pretty well, like getting the confidence of winning a major tournament like that? Did that help transition you into being able to do these clinics in front of, I'm sure dozens and dozens of people and talking in front of strangers essentially at this point? Yeah, I, I would say so, because I think one of the biggest things talking in front of people is confidence. And um, there's a really good book out there called Who's Your Caddy? And uh, I remember reading that in, way back in the day, and it talks about why people like black out or lose what they're going to say in a speech. And it's the same thing while people have like complete shank shots playing golf. And the confidence side of things, your brain doesn't want to be nervous. So it really like puts this puts something into your brain that actually numbs it and you are numb like you're like you don't know what you're doing you don't know what you're saying you don't know what you're doing like we've always done something in a tournament it's like what did i just do i've never done that before your brain is like really shutting off and i think from the early stages of playing and being in front of people and talking and doing podcasts and clinics with a bunch of people, schools, like it's just a lot of experience and getting used to the, the flow of certain things. You know, some people are nervous to talk in front of people. I think that's similar to people nervous playing disc golf in front of a lot in front of a big crowd. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you look at, you know, I was talking about the, the legend skins match and how you Barry can i mean obviously sexton he's been around so people have been watching him the last several years but you three guys that don't really play you know consistently on tour anymore and just seeing you play i mean someone told me in the crowd i don't know you could you could let me know if this person was way off base but someone told me in the crowd this might be like one of the larger crowds climos ever played in front of there were a lot of people out there yeah when you look at go ahead i was just gonna say and there was no nerves None of you guys look nervous. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that comes down to confidence. And if you've ever talked to Climo, he screams confidence. That guy is one of the more confident people I've ever met in my life. Really. I mean, talking on the broadcast booth, I didn't listen to any of the live coverage, but he's got a lot of knowledge about disc golf. And there's a lot of people that have that knowledge, but it's hard to actually communicate that to thousands of people at the same time while something is going on live in front of you. And that shows his level of confidence in the, in the game, what he's saying. And then you put him right in front of a crowd with no warm up, nothing. And he's just like, let's go. <laughs> Parks hole one, you know, makes the first putt, like it's nothing. And then he's ripping shots. Um, but yeah, he's really confidence is a big thing. All right. I got to know what you mentioned a little bit about, you know, you just got tired of touring. I've heard things from like injuries you, you had some nagging injuries. What, what made you go from, 
you know, being the world's greatest disc golfer to where you're not touring anymore. What, what happened there? Yeah. And the first thing was I started to really get bad shoulder arthritis in, in my right shoulder. And, uh, I went to a guy in Nashville who trains a lot of pro golfers, uh, got an MRI. Uh, only time I've ever passed out was in an, at, during an MRI. And, uh, yeah. And I just remember them saying like, look, you don't have anything torn. Like there is the, there's always the opportunity to have surgery on your rotator cuff or your labrum to where they can clean it up. But you know, you'd be out for eight to 12 months and there's no promise. You're going to come back any better than you already were. Like you can't, you can't have surgery as an athlete and then think you're just going to come back like, Hey, that fixed what was wrong, you know? And a lot of times, unless it's completely broken or torn, you're not going to know until you like get in there, there's bone spurs or, or whatever is wrong in there, a torn ligament. And so I really did not find the joy in playing when my arm hurt and, uh, it just became less and less fun from 2014 to 2017, 2018. Like I just really went declined of, you know, yes, I was the best player in the world, but like by 2017 or 2016, 2017, like I just didn't enjoy the game. Like I used to not necessarily because I wasn't as good, but like it legitimately was not fun to practice. I could, you know, it's mm. not like I had no grip on like, no, you know, a lot of times when you have a shoulder or injury, you can't grip anything strong. Like I could tell I was losing like grip strength. I could tell I was losing distance. I wasn't confident in my backhand. And so I just kind of looked for other avenues and was like, okay, this, this might not be something I'm going to play I'll like touring and play for the next five to 10 years. Like I want to be able to play. I want to be able to throw a ball with my son when I get older. I don't want to not be able to move my arm ever. And so, um, I got away, got a lot more involved in prodigy, obviously got, uh, more involved in doing like disc golf instruction and, uh, making more videos and doing just some other promotional stuff. And then, um, when I really decided of getting back into it, like, you know, kind of like 2020, 2021, it was kind of like, Hey, I'm going to dabble in playing some smaller tournaments and really just kind of stay active. Um, I kind of made the decision like, Hey, if I'm going to get back into it, like I can't, I can't go down the same road, same path and just be like annoyed and frustrated. Like I, I remember for years I would practice putting next to a privacy fence. Like imagine if you're putting right-handed and the privacy fence is on your right-hand side, I couldn't control my arm from not hitting the fence to the right. Like I, I would slam my knuckles into the fence. And so I was like, okay, I can't, I can't be doing this on like, I'm not like bad at this bad at putting, you know, like something's wrong here. And so I would stand next to a basket, metal basket. And I have videos on my phone of like, okay, what is going on? Like, and I, it would literally just shake. Like my arm would lose total control and it would almost feel like, like the arm, like the socket in your shoulder would have no type of ligament attached to it. Like my shoulder popped out or something you going through the putting motion. Wow. It was, it's almost bizarre. Like, and so it gets to a point to where it's like, you know, when you're, when you're bad and you start to, you know, not that I read in the comments, but people are like, oh, he's terrible because he's using those putters. He's terrible because, oh, he's just not good anymore. Like, why would you choose to putt like that? It's like, I don't want to putt like that. Everybody wants to try to make it and have perfect form. Not everybody can do, that, you know? Mm. And so that kind of weighed more into it. Like, look, I don't, I don't need like the, the peanut gallery to tell me like, Hey, do you know you're doing that? Like, yes, I know I'm doing that. My arm hurts. Thanks for letting me know. Thanks for the heads up. So going and <laughs> practicing and, and getting away from that, like I always like to read and get advice from people that have done it before, whether it's, whether it's basketball or whatever, like, you know, there's a lot of people that have had like shoulder impingement or shoulder arthritis or anything like that. And that's, that's uh, kind of what it came up happening. And so I would try to train myself putting left-handed and right-handed because left-handed I can putt perfectly fine and I can teach myself to just putt. And so I would be in the backyard putting straddle, lefty, righty, lefty, righty. 
And that's really how I started to practice left-handed was like, Hey, I'm actually pretty good at putting left-handed. Like if I really needed to switch, I mean, we all could switch to a style and play and practice and probably get pretty good at it. If you really want to get pretty good at it. Like if you only threw rollers and you're like, I'm a, I'm a roller guy, that's it. You'd be the best roller guy, you know, in a couple of months. And yeah. so I was like, it's, it's an arm, you know, it works the same functions, the same. I can, I can practice putting left-handed and not interested in getting shoulder surgery and, uh, it's kind of fun when you're playing a tournament and you hit outside the circle righty and then outside the circle lefty. And yeah, that's, uh, that's my game right now. So where, where is the, you know, after playing, what'd you end up playing? You played 79 holes, right? No, you just played 81 holes. You played 81 holes. What, what's the body feel like right now? After 81 holes, you've got a couple days to recover. Still feel warmed up, ready to roll. <laughs> it's a lot of golf. I mean, yeah. you know, like to play back to play, you know, seven days in a row, essentially. And I say, and I say warmed up because it feels like I just got done playing like a couple hours ago and it's Wednesday, but you know, I still keep myself in shape, still, still work out, still eat really healthy, still extremely active. I might not go out and grind it in the field, I can drive, I drive like 30 seconds away from my house and I go throw like my bag in the field and try to stay, uh, stay loose. And I've got five baskets in my backyard with 50 putters. So I can, I can sit around and putt all day long if I want to. So it's easy to stay loose and stay in it. But I think it's just like the mentality of the tournament is something you can't practice. You can't get that expertise or that feeling of putting for money, putting, Hey, this one matters. You're not going to get another one. Like you putt, mm -hmm. you know, your routine, you, you walking up to the first putt after you haven't played a tournament for a month and you're kind of like, okay, what am I going to do? Am I just going to putt it? Am I going to like pretend like I need to go through my motion, you know, and you're like <laughs> thinking <laughs> and Paul knows what I'm saying. It's like first putt of the year. You're like, okay, what's going to be my routine this whole year. And you throw it and you're like, lying <laughs> out there, like it's yeah. the first one you're like no 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 that's not going to happen like i can't do that this whole year <laughs> after the first hole yeah it is true the, uh, no matter how much you practice the off season that first putt which is now going to be in florida which is weird to say because normally it's in vegas but that first putt you always step up it's always nice to throw one under the basket on hole one because you don't know what's going to happen with that first putt of the year um so what, what does that mean? Does that mean that we're going to see more of you next year? Uh, like where, where are you at on tournaments wise? I think the easy answer is it's hard to get into tournaments. It's pretty difficult to sign up for pro tour tournaments. I mean, they fill up really fast. There's a good bit around um, where I live. Like Florida is not that far for like the opening of the year. But just to sign up for tournaments is difficult, you know, whether it's your rating or it caps out, there's a, however many people are rated a certain amount and then it fills it up and then you're on the wait list. And so, um, I'm always at like Jonesboro, Waco, you know, preserve, like those are three pretty obvious ones that I could easily most likely play, but getting in them is another one. Like, is there a sponsor exemption. Is it not filled up, but you can just sign up and play. Is there, I think they're having qualifying events before something like that. Um, mm -hmm. or they, they did anyways. Um, but there, there's also a ton of tournaments around here where I live, like music city open is three hours away. You know, anything within seven hours is not that bad of a drive. Now what, let's just say theoretically, you know, Jeff spring is hearing this and is like, Oh wait, w Will's thinking about wanting to play in tournaments. What if there was some sort of like exemption that he could give you to be like, Hey, any tournament next year on tour you want to play in, you can play in. If that was the scenario, what does, what does 2024 look like for you? I, I still can't imagine going tour tour life. Like if, if it was something in that scenario, I would look at a calendar and try to plan out going to those events, seeing how, seeing what that looks like on like a real schedule and seeing like, Hey, I'm going to fly out Tuesday. I fly back Monday morning, something like that, whatever it is. It's like, I would have to look at it and actually see a real schedule. Like I, obviously they posted it. You could really plan it out, but 
you know, I, I don't have any intentions of going back on tour and, uh, you know, do you, doing do you miss it? Do is just next level. Will? Huh? Do, did you say, do I, I miss said, it? Do you miss it? Do you miss the tour? Yeah. I, I miss some, some aspects I do. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoy grind. I enjoy to be out there and, and practicing hardcore. I don't, uh, I don't miss not being home. You know, I, I can't imagine going yeah. a week without seeing my two year old son. And, uh, you know, when you listen to a lot of people talk about kids growing up, you really have four or five years until they create their personality. So you got to really soak in every hour that you have until they, you know, until they're really going to school. And once they're going to school, they're at school five days a week. And so, um, I like to just soak in everything about that. Honestly, I can't, I can't imagine not being here with yeah. my wife, my son, my house, all that kind of stuff. Like, could I play a pro tour event a month? Like I could see something like that. And there's some other local events that I could compete at. You know, I, I still envision myself making more videos and promotions and, and that kind of stuff. Like teaching disc golf, I think is something that I'm, that I'm almost more interested in than competing and playing because it's, it's really rewarding. And one of the only reasons why I, en I enjoy, you know, social media period is people coming up and saying like, Hey, you're the reason why I even play disc golf. You're the reason why I even learn to yeah. throw. Like that goes, a, that goes a long way. Like, you know, for, for me, there were, uh, adults that grabbed a 13, 14 year old me in Knoxville and changed my life. So it's like, if I can make a five minute YouTube video that gets 700,000 views and people comment, wow, this makes me enjoy the sport more like that to me is like way more rewarding than playing events. It just is mm -hmm. like where I enjoy and see that return in giving back the same way that the sport gave back to me. Yeah. I think, I think some people maybe listening to this are maybe on the, uh, maybe we're a little selfish and wanting you to, you know, play more events. And I think sometimes we, you know, I think it's easy sometimes to just be like, Oh, it's not that hard for you to just like go out and play the OTB open. And, you know, when you have a family, when you have a home, you're like, man, it, it is tough to kind of just get away for a week and then come back. Like that's not easy to do. And just hearing you talk about the grind that you've already done on tour and then like taking a break from that, it, it, it's, it can't be easy to be like, Oh yeah, I'm just going to jump right back into doing that same old, same old of where I'm just on the road for, you know, 30 weeks of the year, or whatnot it might even be more now with how the tour is, you know, pushing it super late into the season. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we would all love to see you, especially at some of the bigger events, right. If you can make it to some of the majors, um, and like you were saying, come some of the Waco, preserve some of those events as well. Cause I mean, I watched you throw dude. Uh, you, you can still compete. I don't know what these comments are telling you. Otherwise I, I told Yuli the throw that you had on hole three, that was by far the farthest throw I've seen, um, on that hole ever. And then, uh, the putt that you made on hole two, people were telling me that you're playing left-handed and you walked up and banged like a 45, 50 footer on hole two for a skin. I'm like, what the heck is going on? So, um, you know, I think I speak for a lot of people saying like, we would, we would definitely probably love to see you play in more events if it is at all possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate that. Like I love, you know, it's always funny making a post online. And the first comment is when you're going back on tour, like that's the first comment, right? Like that's uh, and, and I can appreciate people wanting me to play. Like I it's, it's heard and, um, means a lot that people, I guess people care to want to see me go out there and play and, you know, I, I know, you know, I, like you said, like there's life, there's priorities, you know, I, I would of course love to be able to just, Hey, everybody hop in an RV and let's go play 30 tournaments a year. But that's pretty unrealistic. I think realistic is, you know, five really big tournaments four four or five big tournaments, like pro tour level tournaments, you know, maybe, maybe worlds, if you can even get into it and USDGC is like a good way to look at it. That'd be sweet. That'd be awesome. What about, um, uh, sorry, Brody. One, no, go. You know, one of the things you, you were talking about is how cool was it when uh, Gannon won last year 
and it was posts in himself as a little kid, you know, watching you. And then there's posts about him and, and you being his favorite player. I, I always think that that's crazy to, to think how long we've been playing, but especially you, I mean, I guess, um, being his favorite player and you having some sort of influence on, on a kid like that. And now that's the future and designing his whole entire game, you know, around you and wanting to be like you, that's got to feel special. And and then that kind of leads into another question. Uh, it was funny. We played together this week and it was like, it was show and tell for me because I were playing with these guys and I'm like, watch this, watch this guy throw, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, wait, wait till you see what, what I'm dealing with out here, you know? And we're like looking at each other, like, what the heck was that? These guys are just ripping it so far. What What is that like to see like the progression of the game, you know, um, just in the, in the last few years? It's pretty wild, you know, and, um, you know, just to reiterate on, on the Gannon situation, like that's, uh, that's, that's exactly what we're, what I'm referring to. Like, you know, one, I remember taking the video. I remember him walking around 2014, 2015 USDGC walking around with me in the rain, the last round. I remember this kid clapping every single shot I threw. And I was like, this is, I mean, I was on like the fourth or fifth card, you know? So there's really not like that big of a gallery. I was like, uh, you know, that's really cool. This kid's walking around. And so I went out of my way and I gave him a disc out of my bag and took a picture with him, which is like, you know, the picture that we took on hole 18 that you're talking about. And, you know, that kind of stuff to me is more rewarding because that, that was me, that was me, you know, and, uh, not that that shaped Gannon's career by any means, but if it just did in the smallest amount, like, you know, that goes to show a lot of players now that are out there playing and traveling. Like when you, when you see young kids and you see anybody like we're just a blip, you know, I, me growing up and playing for eight to 10 years, like I'm just a, I'm just a blip. Everybody playing right now, like is, you know, live it every single moment. Like it is your last, but remember that. And it's going to go by in a snap of a finger, but you can affect the people coming up for having that next generation. And, uh, that's still where disc golf is. Disc golf is still in that next generation phase. Like it's not, it's not the golden age by any, by any way. It's still growing so fast. And we played with two players from Europe and one of them said, we're on hole five. And he's like, Hey, do you remember me? Like we're on hole five. Like, yeah, we're, we're, we're playing together right now. We're on yeah. hole five. He's like, no, I met you. I met you eight or 10 years ago in Europe at a clinic. I went to a clinic you and Seppo did. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like, that's like, blows me away and then i watch him throw and it's like <laughs> like you know <laughs> ripping it to the side of the hill on hole 12 and it's like uh, hey sorry guys paul and i are only going to throw it like 400 feet we'll, we'll try to be safe but we'll keep it moving <laughs> for you guys okay like so sorry we couldn't keep it up for you <laughs> yeah yeah they could just blast it but it was just so four five holes in and he's like hey you remember me i'm like i, I no i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. But then he's like, I was like, man, you kind of looked familiar, but a lot of Europeans kind of look familiar. You know, it's like hard to remember their names and their last names. Like, you know, unless you see them a bunch, it's kind of hard to really make it stick out because you don't see them on footage or photos or anything like that. And uh, it, it's just unbelievable how, you know, I used to go over to Finland and do six clinics. I'd be there for over a month and we would go to different towns, a new clinic every day or every other day we would do a signing and a clinic in the same day, a signing and a clinic in the same day. And then we would go to Estonia. I met, I remember meeting silver and Kristen in Estonia and playing the Estonian open. And they were just kind of, I remember silver was into it and Kristen was just kind of getting into it. If I remember could be wrong, but it seems that seems right. And I mean, that's eight, nine years ago right now. And, uh, it's just, you know, that obviously there's a lot of history. You could go on and on and talk about stories like that, but just a little bit, little, littlest thing can have the longest term effect, especially when you have, or at the level of a top player, you know? And I think for the, the, I say the kids that are now playing as pro disc golfers should really be thinking of like, Hey, what can we do to really use my status of whatever champion to, give back a day of the month to grow the sport or two days of the month 
to grow the sport. There's a lot of new things that are going on that weren't going on back then. Like the whole you play stuff like that never existed back then. Like if a pro went to a school to teach disc golf, it was like major news. Like that almost never happened at all. Right. Like it was, it was a pretty big deal and that's happening all the time. Like I saw a school bus show up to go to the preserve. It's like, what? <laughs> <Yeah. World? laughs> how many kids are coming out here right now? Like that's, that's un- almost unbelievable <laughs> that that stuff is happening, but you know, it's just what is going to get disc golf to the next level. That's why it's on ESPN. That's why it's on CBS. That's why they have more sponsors. That's why there's more eyeballs, more followers, all that kind of stuff. You just have to continue to build, build the eyeballs on the sport. Yeah, that's well said. All right. Before we, uh, we, we do appreciate you giving us the time before we let you go though. Uh, if you're not familiar with the show, we always ask pet peeves. We always ask what are some things and, and actually from you, it'd be really great to know some maybe pet peeves that don't exist anymore, but used to exist in disc golf. I think that would be fun for some of our listeners of like, what are some things that happened in disc golf? You know, when you were first touring or first playing, they might not happen anymore. People might not remember them that, uh, you could bring to light that maybe, uh, got under your skin or whatnot or you're just like, Oh man, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah. And for those that know me well, no, I have a lot of pet peeves, but <laughs> the one that doesn't exist anymore is long award ceremonies. That's probably <laughs> the most oh annoying thing on the planet. I totally forgot about those hours. Yeah. Oh. Nobody knows what an award ceremony hours? is. Dude, hours. Are you kidding me? Wait, what? We're talking oh, there about were raffles and there were yeah. tier, CTP, A spot throw offs, twenty seventh place in MA four. Here we go. And, and are you at got... the end? Like the the big oh, winner yeah. is the very yes. last one? I specifically remember being at many tournaments where they wouldn't do pro until their last. You'd be like, Hey man, I gotta drive twelve hours to a tournament. They'd be like, I'm not giving you your money. We don't do PayPal. <laughs> You can, you're, I'm going to, I got cash for you and that's it. And they're like, you're, you got to wait. I'm sorry. And you know, now it doesn't exist anymore. And so you're like, Hey man, I got to go. I got a big tournament. I got to go to like, sorry. And so everybody gets their prizes and leaves and in a hundred person B tier, there's five people left and like first place in open men. And then you go there and you're like, well, <laughs> thank you guys. And then you hit the road. <laughs> speed, speed. Yes. All, I mean, like the one dude, drunk guy in the back. Oh man, that's, uh, that's I mean, at, at that point everybody was drunk in the back, Brody. We were there for four oh. hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you said that, the first thing that popped in my head was the uh, this year world's uh, opening ceremony, where it was just hours of someone just talking about uh, their Olympic sport. But that's a different thing. Um, Yuli, hit him with the last question. Yeah. So. I get, we'll do throwback back in the day when you were playing a bunch and competing with the best players of the world in the world at the time, who did you look at with a little jealousy as far as form or putting sidearm who, who back then were you always like a little bit envious of of your wish? I wish I had that skill. Okay. For one year, it was Nate Doss because I got top four in every major every national tour and Nate beat me in every single one of those events. <laughs> <laughs> he beat me in every single one worlds, USDGC, every single national tour. He beat me in every single one and he made every putt. He threw every drive. He never threw it far, but he could do everything and he would park it. He would never bogey. He wouldn't shoot 1100, but he would shoot 1070, 1070, 1070, 1070, and you would lose by five. <laughs> I'll never forget. <laughs> yeah, that's a good year, one. He beat me every, literally every single tournament. Did he ever win USCGC? Yes. He would be. He would be my. He would be my. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know that year well. Um, he would. He would be my vote for this legend skin match. He would be awesome to see come out and play. Yeah, because that's another person, three-time world champion. Yeah. I mean, there's a I lot. I think of you people... might have mentioned him at the beginning, but he would. I think a lot of people that are in disc golf now have never seen him play in person. Yeah, I mean, oh. and and to say on his game, like it, he 
watch Climo and played with Climo. Like I didn't play with Climo a whole lot. I played with Barry. Barry was around for a lot longer than Climo. I played, I played with Barry a lot. I haven't really played with Climo a whole lot. And Nate mirrored his game around Climo. Like he played against him a lot. Like I remember disc golf TV playing in Santa Cruz at the master's cup. And I think Nate was 18 or 19, something like that. Yeah. Like I, I remember he was the, he was the kid on tour. Wow. Yeah, so maybe maybe we can get word out to to Nate to to uh, it'd be a little bit of a flight for him, but I'm sure everyone would really appreciate uh, him coming out and playing. Um, all right, well, Will, do you have anything else? Uh, give you now, maybe you know, if you want to shout anything out, anything that's going on. Um, I'm sure tons of people listening right now would love to somehow support you or your family or anything like that. Yeah, there's re- there's really nothing. I don't have you know signature series discs like a lot of these players have, and you know I I like to. Uh, I guess my only com- my only final comment would be for all the like I, I had already said earlier. There's not a new players out there, and uh, building a brand, building your name goes a long way. But just affecting, just think that you can affect one one person's life by making a simple gesture of giving a disc away, teaching them how to play bringing them to the course. And in 10 years, there's going to be that next, you know, for me, it was Gannon. Like I just ran into him and there, boom, there he is, you know, and you have these little seeds where you go. For me, for sudden, me, it was Will. Right. That's, and it's true. <laughs> like you, you just never know who you're going to connect with and what they could end up doing. And so when you travel around and you get the best job in the world to be a pro disc golfer and you travel around and it, and it really is one of the best things to, you could ever choose to do that, you know, counted, you can make money at it and like to travel around and stuff, but you should really consider you're leaving seeds everywhere you're traveling. And one of those is going to become yeah. the next amazing player. And it takes a little bit of time, not a lot, just a really little bit of time to affect somebody's life. And you, and you get to run across a lot of people. So Take, take a little time and give a disc away, teach a kid to play, try to link up with the school, do a clinic, whether it's for five people or 50, it could just could make a big difference. Love that. Well, you're an incredible well ambassador said. ambassador for disc golf. I know everyone listening, uh, we are so uh, happy and fortunate to have someone like you, a champion that has stuck around and, and done so much for the sport. So uh, we really appreciate it. And we appreciate you taking the time out of your, your night, your busy uh, week, I'm sure after playing all week um, to, to come on here and chat with us. I know everyone really appreciate that. And we did for sure as well. So thank you so yeah. much for that. Yeah. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Of course. Have a wonderful night, man. Okay. All right. Your three time USDGC champion, Will Schustrick, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. How cool, that was how cool. cool is that? That was cool, man. That was cool. <laughs> Going a little bit down memory lane. Yeah. That was, that was, that was pretty <laughs> sweet, man. That was pretty sweet. And uh, yeah, I just loved, loved his message there at the end. One where it's like, man, we are, we are in like, obviously right now you can, you can see all the growth and, see all the incredible stuff and you maybe can get wrapped up in it, but you got to remember too, like we are, we are in a stage right now of where we got to keep getting people excited. And you know, that's, that's a great message for not just everyone on tour, but just everyone in disc golf of like, Hey, let's just keep, keep spreading this sport around, keep telling people about it and get people out throwing the disc and then enjoying it. So that was awesome. That was, that was freaking sweet.